So the NT neck, it's something that comes on all tailors um, and has for the past, oh, five, six years. It's very simple. You know, I can reach into a guitar like this. This is just a demo guitar. There would be three bolts if a person were doing this in real life. And the neck simply comes off the guitar. Um, what happens with, uh, with this is the guitar can, you know, a lot of people might concentrate on you can reset the neck of the guitar and that's the main benefit. And then people might argue, well, if the neck's right, why would you have to reset it? Well, guitars eventually often can use a reset. But let's talk about setting the guitar up in the first place. You know, there's really one neck angle that's great on a guitar. Every other angle is wrong. And the difference between the right one and the wrong one can be a fraction of a degree. By us being able to put necks on this way, we have these little spacers that are each made at uh, a varying angle difference. And you'll notice that this thing says, uh, I have to take my glasses off because I'm old, minus 12 to be able to see that. Uh, to be able, what we've got is, is this thing is graduated to minus 12. That's an arbitrary number. We start at zero and we go minus two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 20, and we go plus two, four, all the way up to 20. Each one of those is four hundredths of a degree. How much is that? That would be like if we put, uh, took a piece of paper and sliced it in half thickness-wise, half the thickness of a piece of paper and shimmed this up by those types of increments. So if you owned a, uh, a bolt-on you know, a Fender guitar or something, you've ever taken the neck off and put a business card under it and put it back on to change the angle. You know, imagine changing the angle by just that minute fraction. What that allows us to do, when we set the guitar up in the first place, we can send the guitar out with the perfect angle. We haven't glued the neck on the guitar. We, we're not going at it with a chisel. You know, how do you change a, a neck four hundredths of one degree with a chisel? It's basically impossible. You can't do that. So we've taken with this neck the ability to have a straight neck. You notice when it was off, the wood came all the way down to the very end. So we don't have this sort of hump at the 14th fret. And uh, the great thing about it is when it's all together, it just looks like a traditional guitar, which is part of our design process. One thing that's real important to me is that as we um, innovate new things on the guitar, we're trying to leave the aesthetics the same because guitars were beautiful in their form when I arrived on the scene and we're trying to keep them that, that base, basic same aesthetic beauty. So it was sort of a, uh, a radical change in how the guitar functions and how well it functions and yet there's no change at all in its cosmetics. Well, that's, uh, that's sort of how that whole little system works. Well now we've got the guitar polished and we've just cut the pocket in the body. The bridge has been glued on. We simply remove a mask that we put in place before we put the finish on. That exposes the wood. There's already holes that are drilled in here that know exactly where the bridge goes in relationship to the neck. It's all done at the same time this pocket is cut. The electronics have been installed. The expression system. We've got the treble bass and volume control here. We've got a pickup that fits underneath the fretboard. We've got two sensors inside. The battery is located down here. It uh, simply snaps out, nine volt battery, comes out like this, pops right back in, strap and the strap pin and the, and the jack. Now here's the neck for this guitar. The final contouring has been done here. You can see that uh, this has a nice finished look. Uh, when we looked at them earlier, they were covered with finish, paste filler, lacquer, that type of thing. Now it's been taken down to its exact size. This has been trimmed. You'll notice that the bolt holes are all exposed. There's a little piece of foam here that puts a slight pressure down on the pickup. There's a magnet here that's actually part of the pickup system. This magnet works in conjunction with these other five. So you've got five magnets here, and the fifth one, which is on the B string, is pulled out of alignment. So you have magnet, 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 then one up here, actually way up here, and back there. That's how we control how loud the B string is. Normally in a system, you can get a B string that's a little bit too loud, but we pull 
volume out of it by placing a magnet in a totally different location than the rest of them. The neck is going to fit on here, and before it does, we have to put these spacers. These are made in, uh, in increments of, of angle. This one says it's a zero. This one here says it's a minus six. I'm going to put the zero shim right in here. That's basically going to set this guitar at a level neck angle. It's not up and it's not down. This one is going to be minus six. What that's going to do is it's going to preload the neck a little bit because the difference between the zero and the minus six is exactly how much the strings stretch the neck through the heel. This has all been calculated on an NT neck so that we get perfect straight necks all the time. You put a neck on a guitar and you string it up, there's some bowing that the truss rod takes out and there's a little bit of stretching that happens through this section of the neck. That's all mitigated by us having these super accurate shims and being able to take care of the preload. If I had a number two on here, I would have a minus four here. If I had a six on here, I would have a zero down there. So the difference is always a negative six. This is now gonna fit right into this guitar and it'll carry the neck angle that this shim set gives. If it's too little or if it's too much, we just, we just pull this neck off and put another set of shims in. And each one of those can vary the, the pitch that the neck fits onto the guitar body. We had been using pickups from third-party suppliers for a long time, and it, it got to where we wanted to have something that took us to an, a new level, a new level in tone, um, a new level in the implementation of how it actually fit inside the guitar. Personally, we had gotten to a point where um, we felt that there could be something better than the piezo sound. That sound had been pretty much tweaked to within an inch of its life. There's a lot of preamps, a lot of effects that have been put on it, but still underlying that whole sound was the sound of the piezo crystal, which, um, you know, this is a little complex, but it's called a square law device. That means if you hit it twice as hard, it puts four times the output. If you hit it four times as hard, it puts 16 times the output. And that's why you might notice when you play a piezo really soft, it might sound fabulous. And you go, okay, I'm ready to go. Your band starts playing and you play like this. And then all of a sudden it, it sounds more brittle and distorted because that's the nature of that device. That was just one thing. We didn't know where we were gonna go with that. Um, the other thing is the subject of us whether we're developing it or whether somebody else developing, was going to develop it. At that particular point in our life, our company was large enough to where we could bear the development costs. And so we decided on our own to go ahead and develop this new system, which we had no idea what it was going to be when we started into it. We began to explore at that point. But there's a certain uh, freedom when you're making something yourself that you can't get when a third party person's doing it. Indeed, a third party person, uh, a subcontractor, may not have, they, we don't give them access to our guitar. You would think that we would just be willing to let them do anything that they could possibly do, but we're not because it's our guitar. The other thing is we're gonna be a little bit proprietary about what goes on. So, you know, a third party supplier's pickups are on everybody's guitars. So did we want to jump in and put tons and tons of money into something that eventually it's going to find its way to everyone's guitar? Or do we want to develop it ourselves? It, so it's very simple. We chose to develop pickups ourselves and uh, go the uphill battle in the learning curve and the marketing of it and the servicing of it and getting it there for the ultimate goal of having something that we feel is better in not only the way that it sounds, but in the way that it's implemented. With the uh, expression system, there were a couple of great design ideas that we felt were great just for the, the ergonomics of the guitar. For one thing, we moved the battery and all the power supply down to this section of the guitar that before that had never really been used. There was no real estate, uh, or this was a, a kind of an untapped real estate, and normally the battery of the guitar and, and all the power supply and all of that heavy item was sitting up here that made the guitar out of balance. And usually there was a big, some type of door or plug or something that was a, a lot of players felt was unsightly. People have kind of grown, 
used to it, but we felt, you know, what if we can move that to a place on the guitar that's a little bit more pleasing visually? So we were able to split that up. That left us with just three knobs up here. We went with a real uh, very analog approach. We didn't want to get into digital business and tuners in the guitar. We wanted it to be just really aesthetically simple. So when you look at the, the implementation or the embodiment of this pickup, three simple knobs, volume, bass, treble. Can't be any more simple than that. Anybody can figure it out. You don't even have to label it. Someone strums it, oh, that's the bass. You know, it's a done deal. So it becomes very, very simple and it kind of becomes a nice ergonomic part of the guitar. The electronics became very sophisticated. Um, over a period of time, this, this system developed. We went with a magnetic system. You see here a magnetic accelerometer. That's basically a vibration sensing device. It was a thing that never existed before, except for maybe in geotechnic terms, they use it to, to uh, uh, monitor seismic activity, things like that. We, we developed these, sort of invented how they worked, gathered the materials together, figured out how to make them. They sit on the guitar, they vibrate along with the top, and they put out a really nice signal. It's magnetic. Magnetic is not like a piezo. It's not square law. It's linear. So if you hit it twice as hard, it's twice as loud. If you hit it four times as hard, it's four times as loud rather than 16 times as loud. So it's a nice linear amplification. We also put a string sensor on. This is a lot like a, just a pickup that someone would put in the sound hole. I've taken this neck off before earlier, but this pickup is under here. It, since it's magnetic, it needs to be a humbucker, so there's a dummy coil here. All three of these things are summed into the circuit board. And uh, there's even a switch in here that can turn on and off these sensors individually. We have a string ground here that helps quiet the guitar if there's any type of 60 cycle hum. We even have a fuse that's another innovation of ours. It's a patented device that we have because everyone knows that you play electric guitar, you walk up to a mic, if there's a ground loop problem, you touch the mic, you get shocked. You know, people get, there's four or five people every year around the world that get killed by that type of thing. So we invented a five milliamp fuse system where the fuse blows. So we've got that in every Taylor guitar that has electronics in it that's magnetic based. If there's a string ground, there's a fuse. We're not making the user the ground, you know. Guitars are the only thing I know of in the world that make the user the ground. So it's, it's kind of odd. We were able to solve those types of things. Why did we do it ourselves? Because we feel that we can invent a lot more that way. We're doing it in-house with our team and we're not making phone calls going, hey, can you think of a solution for this? We just work on it, we talk around the water cooler, we tweak it, it all constantly evolves. And we feel that that's really the best way to get a guitar to be built as good as it can possibly be. Even if it means that acoustic guitar makers become electronics designers. There are people out there, you can hire them, bring them in, they can help. So we're here with Taylor, and he's going to be putting a neck on this guitar, showing us how it's done. One of the first things that we're going to want to do is decide which set of these shims that we want on the guitar, because each guitar is, comes out a little bit different. He's going to put this special fixture on that we've devised. It's a little pistol grip, and he can put it in the guitar, clamp it down. It clamps it to the guitar, and it's got a little floating arm out here that reads a number on his gauge. Once he's taken a few readings and he's satisfied with what he knows that number is, what that's really doing is measuring the arch of the top, the angle of this pocket. He can then come over and pick the appropriate shims. Once those shims are picked, you know, probably eight times out of ten, he'll have the, the angle right on the money. The great thing about this is if he does final assembly of this guitar, he strings the whole thing up, tunes it up, and he decides, well, I really missed on the angle. It's off by a, you know, a portion of a degree. He can just simply pop the neck off, put a new set of shims in, and uh, he's all set to go. <clears throat> so now the shims are in place, the neck goes on, and it's time to put the bolts in. So there's three bolts that hold the neck on. The one that he's putting in now is the one that's pulling the fingerboard down to the top. And then there's two that go into the heel. So it's held one down, two forward. He's going to tighten this one down. 
So first he tightened the first one down to pull the neck forward. Now he's going to tighten this one down. He's going to put a clamp on here to seat the heel to push it all the way down. So he's going to put pressure on it. He'll go inside there and he'll loosen the bolt just a little bit so the neck can drop down right where it needs to go so there's no distortion anywhere. Then he can put the final bolt in. You get incredible wood-to-wood -wood contact with a joint like this. It's a different joint than, uh, than a dovetail, which a lot of guitar makers use. Um, a lot of consumers that don't really know their woodworking just know what they've heard about guitars. They don't, they've never really made a dovetail joint or seen how a neck goes on a guitar. And so you hear a lot of talk out there on the forums, that type of thing, that a dovetail joint is wood-to-wood -wood contact and it produces better tone. But in reality, you've seen how these fit. There's incredible wood contact on these, probably more than any dovetail I've ever seen. Taylor's finishing up right now with uh, just a special little, it's a stay soft filler that we put in. It fills, again, we leave a tiny bit of a gap around this thing. It's infinitesimally small. And then we just put this little, it's almost like a caulking. And it's just a cosmetic thing that we run around the guitar. We have them mixed up in every color you can imagine to put against spruce, to put against white binding, to put against rosewood, ebony. And we just make this stuff here out of some ingredients and it never hardens up. Put it in, wipe it off. Two years from now, you want to take it off. It's still a soft thing and never glues the neck in place. Once he's done with this, the guitar is really ready for strings. So it's just a matter of putting in a saddle, getting the guitar cleaned out, the labels in, and string it up. The T5 is much the same as an acoustic. We use the exact same principles for neck angles. This one's got a very similar pickup right here that we have, on, as same as we have in the acoustic. It's got another one here, and it's got a body sensor in the back here. And it's those three pickups that give the T5 their unique sound. We'll watch Taylor uh, put a, uh, a neck into one of these. You'll see it's uh, almost the exact same deal. They don't actually measure these with the pistol. They just take a good educated guess at where they're supposed to be. And of course, they, they get pretty good at knowing where, where, where it's going to be. The system that you see going together on the T5 is exactly what's happening in the uh, solid bodies. Exactly the same thing. The bolt that holds the neck in is drilled with what we call an interference fit. In other words, instead of the receptacle and the hole lining up perfectly, they're offset. They, they don't line up perfectly. So when we put the bolt in and tighten it down, it also, just because of that, not only pulls the neck down, but it pulls the neck forward. And the neck is coming forward onto a V-shaped, uh, almost dovetail type joint, which causes, when there's pressure on it that way, it causes any side to side motion totally cease. So one bolt pulls it down, pulls it forward, locks it, and there's no side to side play. And we're ready for strings. So uh, Adrian's getting the final strings onto a uh, solid body standard model. And again, it's much the same. I'm gonna reach in here. We can see that it's got the same type of a neck system on the back as the T5 had. A very uh, intricate puzzle lock piece neck joint, a shim underneath it to set the angle. We preset the saddles. The whole bridge gets preset to the height we want and we aim the neck at the bridge. Uh, what a lot of makers do is the neck is set and there's nothing they can do about that and then they raise and lower the bridge to get the action right. We do it the other way around. We get the bridge right where we want it to be and then we're able to just put different shims in the neck until we get the right angle. So Adrian's now looking down, adjusting the truss rod. He's going to go through and tune this guitar up, test the whole thing out. He's got a whole uh, bin full of guitars that he'll go through individually and do that too. And then they go in for a play check and a final inspection. The acoustics and the electrics are all being done in the same room here. 
Well, we're in the final inspection room with Eric Bakker, who's been with us for 20 years. And uh, Eric's been our final inspector for several years now. You can see racks of guitars. They come in a few racks at a time, and he goes through. You know, behind me, you're seeing acoustic guitars on the same, same racks as the electrics. He inspects for the same thing, basically. He's looking for cleanliness of work, all the angles being right, the frets being good. He also is aware of any trends that he might see. If he sees something happening through the factory, then he can go back to that department and mention it to their supervisors. Um, each guitar has a tag on it with the person who did the final assembly. We saw you know, tags under there that said Adrian or Dennis or Taylor. So if there's something he wants adjusted, he can just bring that back. If he has a little inspection tag, he puts it on. And this is where every guitar just gets gone over. They get played, they get tuned. You can see this little line right here. So this film here will show which way the sensor is pointing. So you've got a, a line there. It's, it's absolutely critical that the magnets are spun to the right direction on these for them to sound good. So if you took a, if you took a heavy magnet and went like this, we can turn the magnet around. It would sound like a Leslie speaker if you played the guitar. So there's one spot on these where they sound fantastic. So they have to be oriented when they're put in, and then he double checks to make sure that they're oriented, you know, along the grain lines at the top. When Eric's given them a clean bill of health, then they can go onto a rack with a roll down, and then we ship them into our warehouse and out to dealers from that point. There's not one particular thing in the guitar that I think just needs to be solved for guitar builders. I think the guitar uh, is pretty well developed and now it's just a matter of being a tweak head for the rest of my life and kind of coming up with the next thing. And for the most part, we're pretty happy with just having the freedom to explore and then develop some of those uh, discoveries into products like the NT neck, the expression system, pickup system. the uh, T5 guitar, the solid body guitar. You know, you'll probably see basses from us in the future. There'll be some unique concepts with those when they come out. Um, there's always classical guitars. We've never confronted that. You know, you know, and when each one of these things get their turn and we can focus our attention on it, or if we accidentally stumble across something, you know, that might grab our attention. So, you know, you can do, you can get into guitar innovation and factory innovation accidentally or purposefully. Sometimes when it's accidentally, it's really the best thing. So, you know, that's our philosophy. We come in every day, we make guitars, we solve the problems of the day, and those end up becoming our products of the future, and it's, it's fun to do.